shortest distance between two human hearts is always a story focus on the creator and empowering them through uh through technology through tools that are unique to squadcast like we have two patents pending that uh really get us that quality but also reliability um so that way you know we set people up for success when they go to produce their podcast and reach their audience um it's there's no time wasted having to deal with like uh janky content or like quality issues or alignment and some of these other things that can really slow you down or cost you money in post production Hey guys, this is Avi Arya, father of two girls, six dogs, husband to a superwoman, a street car racer turned hotelier, now social media marketer and founder of Internet Moguls. Welcome to my channel. So Zach, I'm uh, on the 29th of October, I turned 44. But the story that I want to tell you is when I was 18 years old, born and brought up in New Delhi, India, all I wanted to do in life was to race street cars. My dad used to go to sleep and from under his pillow I was uh, steal his car keys race with people make some money on the side and in my 18 year old head I was like I'm going to become a street car racer I'm going to go overseas and study car racing study abroad do all of that I had a plan but one day my dad told me he lost everything in his business and uh, he had a family separation and uh, he said I need to speak to you so I went all the way to his office which was 1 hour from home I remember walking in Zach as if it was yesterday. There was a red carpet on a wooden floor. There were these two landline phones which were off the hook. My dad broke this news to me that we've lost everything. We have to sell the house, sell the cars. I can't go overseas to study. Wow. And as the eldest son in the family, I am expected to start working with him from tomorrow morning. If not, I can leave the house. It's too much for me to handle in a two-minute conversation. That's heavy. Yeah. It was. It was. Thank you for understanding. Oof. And then, so I darted out of the room, and I, you know, my mom was waiting outside. I had a nice conversation with her. and i think better sense prevailed because the very next morning i found myself behind the reception of my dad's small 27 room motel i learned housekeeping i learned restaurant i learned everything but i also learned my dad is doing a fantastic job of running this place where do i find my place under the sun under these circumstances one day an international tourist walked in and he paid us in dutch guilders the currency of euros before the uh, uh, right. currency of holland before the euros came in and i converted the dutch guilders and it turned out to be double indian rupees now i'm telling myself wow I am uh if I am able to convert all 27 rooms into international tourists like this one I double the income double the uh, revenue and I become a star in my dad's eyes and then maybe I can go overseas and pursue my dream I finally had a plan yes I finally had a plan but I didn't know how to execute it because back in the 90s how do you connect a small 27 room hotel to people around the world during that time the zack there was a pheno- new phenomena on the market called the internet this was a service that was allowing people to connect with different parts of the world uh, I saw an ad in the paper satyam computers looking for cyber cafe partners contact rohit after 25 years rohit is still a friend of mine because i was the first person to contact him for a cyber cafe after 3 months of unnecessary paperwork we got a cyber cafe now zack i had 24 hour access to the slowest internet on the planet uh somehow i got in touch with people i got went into forums people said do a website i took 6 months to somehow get a website done then another 6 months to tinker around with things we started getting electronic mail corresponding with people one and a half years of doing that started getting some people coming in from different parts of the world staying with us more people more people more people we had so much business coming in we started booking other hotels after two years of booking other hotels we thought we have enough business on books we can now buy one hotel then we bought another one then we bought another one so zack essentially my dad took 40 years to build his first hotel after we discovered the internet in the next 4 years we outright bought small four small boutique properties so that was our first uh, journey from the internet then i started so a travel it was amazing then by from 18 i'm now 25 i started a travel affiliate business i had no idea what i was doing i kept creating content i got a call from people saying you put a code on our site we'll give you an affiliate i didn't know what an affiliate was they did what i i i did what they told me to do we were making nearly 1000 to 1500 dollars in net profit every single day from those websites in 2005 that was a travel affiliate business lasted for 2 years then i lost all my rankings and the business went down then uh by now tripadvisor facebook all of these large companies had come into india some of them asked me to become their evangelist and say speak on stage around the world for us tell us how a small business leverages these tools and becomes big as you can see in my last 5 minutes of interaction with you i love talking so when i got an, got an opportunity to talk on stage i immediately grabbed it i went on stages all over the world told people my my story uh people started coming to me and saying can you do this for us 
that is where in 2009 uh, with a four member team i started a company called internet moguls uh bootstrapped completely no co-founders no borrowing money four member Respect. team the last 11 years we grew from four to 225 people working with 700 clients in 10 countries so that was our story now i live in vancouver canada my business is in india i travel back and forth i live here with my uh, with my family that was a long form story of who i am where i'm coming from we have uh, i i founded uh, an alliance called the digital masters alliance which is the alliance of all digital marketers in india i'm still the founder of that every almost every major digital marketing event happens through our forums uh, uh, we've got i've got about 200 plus thousand followers on me it, amongst all of us we've got a million followers in the alliance of nine people most businesses happen uh, sort of um, any any large speaker or anybody who comes to india any tools we love to promote them and say we we want to be your gateway to india so i'll introduce you to some of my other master friends sometime soon as well but uh, tyler has been a good friend of mine for a very long time great guy and he only and only talks great things about you guys and i was like it's high time that we get zack on the show and we introduce him to our audiences in vancouver canada and all over india so zack thank you so much for your time this entire story that i told you in 8 minutes i have a 8 second version of it as well here we go Zach, my name is Avi Arya, father of two girls, six dogs, husband to a superwoman, a street car racer turned hotelier, now social media marketer and founder founder of Internet Moguls. So that's my eight second on the eight minute story. We're going to jump in right into the session now. I really appreciate your time, Zach. Like I say, the shortest distance between two human hearts is always a story. You tell a perfect stranger a story, and you you win their hearts for life. Before we get started, for the people who don't know you. What is your story? Well, I appreciate you sharing your story. That was a very, you know, quick masterclass, and uh, uh -huh. it's tough to follow. But um, my story is uh, is one that's really rooted in um, in a common thread, and um, that comes to life in different chapters across my journey. Um, you know, it it for me is about connecting creatives, and I feel that creativity is enhanced when more than one people can come together and collaborate on on something new because uh, there's kind of an element of improv that's introduced that isn't there if we're just kind of in our own head creating. Um, so that's really what I focus on in um, in my personal mission. And um, you know, I have um, I have the privilege of of have um, having been able to bring that to life um, in a couple different ways throughout my career. Um, first. When I was at art school, um, learning um, graphic design and front-end engineering, and teaching myself back-end engineering, um, I saw kind of what happened when two people came together and did like pair programming or collaborated on a design uh, for like print media or for the web um, or for mobile, and that was like the first time I think I experienced it. And then fast forward a couple more years, and I did my internship on the Google Chrome team, where I uh, I pitched an open source project on building something, um, building an extension for developers to collaborate um, for pair programming inside of Google Chrome. Um, and back then, people were using Dreamweaver with like previews of websites kind of baked into that software, but that didn't feel like the real internet to me. So there was like, that was like collaborative creativity brought to life for software engineers. And, um, you know, and along the way, my, my now co-founder and longtime good friend, Rock, introduced me to podcasts. I love learning just kind of fundamentally. Good friend, Rock? Rock, yes. His name is Rock. And he's now my co-founder uh, of Squadcast Not as well. Dwayne Johnson. <laughs> no, no. Uh, although... Uh, bring although... him on the show as well. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I, that'd be cool. Yeah, I'm I'm a big fan. Um, of course, like yeah. Mo Moana is one of my favorite movies, and uh, I think he's hilarious in that movie. Anyway, um, yeah, there we go, Maui. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> nice. Uh, so with uh, with with um, podcasts, I loved listening and learning uh, and going deep on subjects um, very quickly. You know, half hour, sixty minutes, you could learn a lot in a podcast. And I kind of stayed like that for a while, a while. And then um, it wasn't until I was kind of frustrated in my career and wanted to do a creative side project. Um, I have this also this theme of just 
working on things on the side and projects, whether that's art um, or design or client work or um, technology, like side note for our wedding, um, for our wedding, I, I built an app for a restaurant and we traded uh, the app for catering for our wedding. So, uh, so little things like that along the way. And then, um, and then I wanted to do a creative side project that was kind of outside of my comfort zone. And that's really where I started thinking, maybe we should do a podcast. Um, and let's challenge ourselves. Like my brother's an audio engineer. My, my good friend is a, is a decorated playwright. And, um, and I had written, uh, written a book as well. So it's like, we should be able to do this. You know, um, we have some skills that other people maybe don't have. Like hmm. So this was, this was uh, kind of the middle of 2016. So okay. um, I was in like my mid twenties. Yeah. Right. Mid twenties. Um, and that was, uh, that was where we wanted to do the science fiction podcast, this audio drama, and really challenge ourselves and get outside uh, of our comfort zone. None of us had ever done anything like that before. Um, and we set out to do that. And pretty quickly, we found that there were some challenges with uh, with recording quality content when you're not in the same room with the other people that you're collaborating with. Um, and we kind of just kept assuming that that was a solved problem that uh, podcasting had been around for a little while and we just hadn't like done the right Google search or something. Um, and we kept looking, we kept looking and we just couldn't find a good answer other than use Skype. And that's really where we started talking to podcasters and asking them like, okay, you use Skype, but like, are you happy with it? Have you talked to your audience about it? Like, does anybody enjoy it? Uh, is this already a solved problem? And it's not really an opportunity to build something new or is there an opportunity here? And that's really where we kind of took a step back and, and pivoted from the podcast essentially to building out Squadcast, which is that solution. So it's, it's a platform that helps professional podcasters connect with people all over the world and record studio quality content um, in audio and now video. Um, and we focus on we focus on the creative experience. We focus on the creator and empowering them through uh, through technology, through tools that are unique to Squadcast. Like we have two patents pending that uh, really get us that quality, but also reliability. Um, so that way, you know, we set people up for success when they go to produce their podcast and reach their audience. Um, it's there's no time wasted having to deal with like. Uh, janky content or like quality issues or alignment and some of these other things that can really slow you down or cost you money in post-production. So we make that um, really easy to record. Like we can kind of forget sometimes um, you've been a great host and like inviting me here and everything. Um, but, you know, sometimes uh, this isn't true of my experience with you, but sometimes hosts can kind of forget that their guest is not a professional podcaster. So, mm. With Squadcast, we make that super easy for the guest to also be equally as professional. And uh, there's been some research that shows that audio quality is directly tied to the credibility of sure. of the people uh, of the people speaking. Um, and that credibility, you know, when we want to have influence, we want to have our guests come on and you know be experts in their subject. That credibility is meaningful to our show, to our audience, and. That's really where we see uh, our, our, you know, Squadcast, our technology having an impact and really helping a lot of podcasters. We're so grateful to be in service of, of that creative work. Zach, for all the people who are listening, the idea of this show, we call it the internet moguls of the show, people who've used the internet to create massive success for themselves and add value to people's life. Now, as an internet mogul that you are. <laughs> you leverage... I like that title. Thank you. Yes, you are, my friend. <laughs> As an internet mogul and all the others who are listening and wanting to, and getting inspired by your journey, how does a startup find a problem and validate it for themselves that mm -hmm. this is big enough to work on and give a few years? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And I didn't really have the answer before uh, starting Squadcast. This is my first company. I'm a first time founder. Um, Although I will say that uh, there's a lot of parallels uh, between starting a technology company, doing a startup, and say a podcast, um, or 
you know, uh, a creative side project. And really, you know, we all kind of are investors uh, of time, you know, so I feel like there was some kind of mental model for thinking through that. But we we found some really good advice. We want we start we're, uh, we're very much students of the startup ecosystem and the startup space. Uh, so we set out to learn, you know, and, and we use podcasts to, to, to do that. And the, um, we started with a, a, a set of videos on YouTube, a playlist uh, called How to Start a Startup. It was a course at Stanford University that had courses by Y Combinator uh, founders and, and um, alumni. Uh, so we started there and, you know, they were like Eric Reese, Lean Startup. And um, that's how you can kind of create these experiments and come up with the hypothesis, validate it by talking to people trying to remove bias from those conversations to actually learn, is this a legit problem or is this a made up problem? Or another a term we've learned is like, is this a, is this a painkiller? Is this a vitamin, you okay. know, and, and uh, drawing that distinction is exactly the question that you're, you're asking. Right. And that's the process that we did. And, and then as I learned more about the lean startup and read that book, I highly recommend it. Um, or there's videos, you know, this has been around for a minute, so there's probably faster ways than reading the book, but whatever you're into. Um, Eric Reese is a fantastic podcast guest on a number of uh, podcasts. That's another way. Um, but I started to see it as design thinking. So uh, here in California, we have a Stanford and the, the, the D school design school at Stanford and uh, you know, have a spun off a company called IDEO, they have this approach um, called design thinking that really is uh, the same thing as lean startup. It's a way to come up with these hypotheses, test them, and really try to prove or disprove, you know, is this a real problem or is this a made up problem? And uh, that can help you rule out, you know, uh, in the early days to try to say like, you know, because another way to ask the question that you asked is like essentially product market fit. But product sure. market fit, is like product market fit comes like a year later or maybe you know two years three years later depending on how long your your journey is to to find it but this is kind of the first signals of product market fit is just talking to people and you know try to try to see um people who have the problem that you've experienced we were lucky that we experienced this problem firsthand and then we kind of talk to podcasters and say do you have this problem too or, you know, is this just something that we fantasized about and, and thought right. up one day? So I think that's how I think about it. And, you know, we, I've also learned that there's kind of nested experiments. So uh, good ideas tend to lead to more ideas. And, you know, there's the big questions of a startup, but then you start to like, and once you validate that, like we did, uh, we went and sponsored an event to talk to people and get in front of people and show them an alpha product we sponsored podcast movement to get that initial kind of feedback and validation. And I got to be honest with you, Avi, like we were terrified. Uh, you know, that's the part that often is kind of left out of these stories is, uh, you know, at some point you want, you, you want to be, you want this to be something, right? You want to be a startup founder. You want to build something cool that people use, you know, and at some point you start to wonder like, oh, I want this to be true, you know, and that's really the bias piece of it. So trying to remove that. Um, but you know, you eventually you got to put yourself out there and ask the question, you know, is this something you'd pay for, you know, and as soon as you can get to that place and work from there, uh, you know, and, and also being cool with people telling, you, no, <laughs> you know, and, uh -huh. and just like being, being ready for that, if anything, expecting that, you know, I'd kind of be surprised if they say yes. And, um, yeah, I could, I could talk about this one for a minute, obviously, but it's, uh, it's something that uh, I think, you know, those are good resources that have helped us in, in answering that question. Awesome. I love that answer. Tell me, Zach, uh, firstly, is my audio better now? Yeah, you sound good. Okay. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask was, uh, when is it? You said, like, you know, the product market fit comes one, two, three years later. And as soon as a startup founder or to be prospective uh, founder, somebody who start thinking, you know, let me quit my job, start a company or have a business plan, start a company. The person yeah. listens to what you just said in like two to three years to find a product fit. How am I going to survive for those three years? Yeah. So uh, people who are listening to this and want to become internet moguls like yourselves and find a problem in the market, do you, su do you suggest they always hold on to whatever source of income they have and do this on the part-time? Mm -hmm. part before they can actually jump in full time? 
I used to have a yes or no answer to this question. Uh, I mm-hmm. feel like it's a bit more nuanced now, depending on the the kind of landscape of all the possible startups, right? Like on one end of the spectrum, you have like uh, startups that have to deal with a lot of regulation. So um, depending on what region or country you're in, regulation may mean different things. But um, what kind of blew my mind here was going to a reverse pitch day in San Francisco, um, and seeing a, a, a medical startup out of uh, UC Davis that for that had a male contraception um, like prototype startup and um, had raised a seed round through through this fund, um, their runway to even have a, a potential product because of the the scrutiny and regulation of introducing a new medical treatment into um, you know the medical community as a it's a multi year process. Um, so with that, you know, the answer is like, um, you, you almost, you have to, you have to raise money in that scenario. You, you're not going to bootstrap your way. Sure. Uh, unless you have some crazy scenario, you know, Mm -hmm. I guess it'd be possible for some people coming from means, but I think, uh, most people are not necessarily coming from means. Like, um, I, I, I can't speak for you, but I, I am not coming from means along those lines. Um, and that's okay. So to answer your question, in our case, um, well, let me finish my anecdote for a second. Sure. So that, that's kind of one end of the spectrum, right? Is like this medical thing that's going to take a long time. You probably need to raise. It's going to be multiple years before you even start to think about a product um, and a market. So how do you know if you have product market fit and uh, you know the testings and all the stuff that's involved with that? Um, on the other end of the spectrum is something like Uber. On day one of Uber, they had product market fit and they, they, how people I've heard different people within the company at that time tell the story is like, it was scary. It was like, all of a sudden you're on the world stage and like the game has changed and all, all of this stuff. Right. So that is extreme product market fit on day one. Like they didn't have to wait at all. You know, they could basically walk into any venture capital fund and just be like, let's party, you know? So I think that that's two ends of the spectrum and most companies are probably in the middle somewhere to be real about it. Uh, especially with like modern SaaS and cloud and, um, all the pieces there that make it easier to, or faster to start a startup. Um, that's been accelerating over the last couple decades is the, um, kind of building blocks of a startup have gotten more malleable and easier to access. And that, definitely makes uh, bootstrapping and getting a, iterating through product to find fit um, is something that uh, we, in our story, we kept our day jobs for a year and a half while right. we, uh, we bootstrapped from that. We, were, we are our angel investors uh, in, in the case of Squadcast. And um, you know that comes with a level of independence that uh, we're very proud of having, you know, been in the game for almost five years now, um, and been able to make a sustainable company and grow the team. And, you know, some of these huge milestones that seemed like science fiction when we were first starting Uh out, um, you know, we, we just wanted to do the experiment, honestly, of like, can we bootstrap this or how long can we bootstrap this before we start to need to cross a bridge where we can't afford to pay for it? And uh, the first milestone that we set for ourselves was like, let's get the technology to pay for itself. Like that's the first, before we even start to think about paying ourselves or quitting our jobs or going and spending other people's money, um, let's try to get the technology to pay for itself, like kind of a break even on, on the technology costs. So we did that. And then we were like, okay, that's probably a pretty good indicator that we should quit our jobs. And during that time, Rock and I had, each uh, set, saved um, and had a financial support system um, where we could essentially have a year of runway from that point to get to a point where we could pay ourselves. And that was kind of the shakiest period of time in this right. whole this whole thing. Um, you know, and I, I sold my car, like we made a bunch of sacrifices, slimmed everything down. We had kind of been preparing for this to some sense. Like, I don't think any of us had a plan for our savings or how we were invested or anything like that, but it was just kind of like, 
okay, we have some sort of savings. My, my wife has a job, you know, I can, I could do work on the side. I know rock did some accounting work on the side in that 12 month period, just to kind of uh, supplement. But we made it to that point. And, you know, at that point we, we started paying ourselves. We started, you know, paying our team, they quit their day jobs. And, uh, and then we've been growing, growing the team and the product from there. And then we, you know, had a, had a, have had two different, you know, pretty massive inflection points along the way that are just completely outside of our control. But, you know, I think it, once you have product market fit and you've built up, you know, in our case, we are very careful and mindful about crafting a reputation, you know, that sure. is meaningful to us in the community. So, you know, when a tidal wave comes, you got to be ready to catch it. And, um, you know, your technology needs to scale your, um, your team needs to, you know, be, be ready for that prepared to scale. And, um, you know, we're really grateful that, uh, for the, for those things as well. Awesome. Uh, my next question is when somebody finds a product market fit and if I think I've found something, but how do you validate or how do you even analyze if that product will be relevant five years from now? That's a hard one. Yeah. Because that I think gets to the timing here, which is also outside of people's control, you know, and they're the, the road of startups is littered with the corpses of, you uh -huh. know, companies that didn't have the right timing. Um, the founders of Twitter, before they founded Twitter, uh, they founded a podcast company called Odeo. And um, the timing wasn't right. Podcasting wasn't there. The ecosystem wasn't ready for a platform sure. like that. And also, the tech, there were some substantial technology pieces that were not in place either. One example is that most audio video on the web at that point in time was used, uh, used Flash to achieve that. And Flash was not a stable platform to really grow a business off of. Um, and it certainly wasn't standardized across browsers. So you have uh, licensing and things like that. So that was ahead of its time. And they killed it, you know, and then they pivoted and did Twitter. So uh, I guess that's, you know, uh, serendipitous in some way. Um, I don't think anybody would change that story. But, you know, I think um, even if you can have a clear vision and see product market fit, if the timing is not right there, I don't think there's much you can do about it. Um, that's a really tough one. What I've seen companies do and this is another way to use venture capital is if you're taking a position that's a very long time horizon, you just need to make sure that your investors are um, on board with it. Are, are in alignment on that. And, and that is very clearly articulated and try to support that with as much like evidence um, as you can. I mean, I, I do think there's an element here, a pretty big element of like, a, at some point you just have to make like a gut decision, you know, is sure. this... Do I believe this like, is going to happen? Wonder, and that's where I think founders, right? They, you, you have to believe. Have you, have you wondered what if YouTube came up with uh, a solution for most podcasts or most interviews are being featured on YouTube? Yeah. What if uh, they come up with a solution? What if Twitter comes up with a solution? Uh, you do wonder all of that along the way, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and that's good. And that's good to do. Do you always, on, also coupled with this question is, do you sometimes feel uh, if they do, I'll be a better product and maybe they can buy me out or integrate with me. And so let me do what I'm doing best because they look for the best company mm -hmm. and I need to be the best. And so forget about them making it themselves. Let me worry about them. If they think about it, I should be their first choice. Do you also think about those kind of things? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and I don't think that ever really goes away. Um, we, we started this knowing that Microsoft already had a solution here. And right. it's an audacious thing to say that we could, we think we could do something better than Microsoft could. Um, you know, and, and that's essentially the statement that we made when we first set out to, to try to build something here. Um, and, you know, and the same is true for Zoom, the same is true for, um, you know, some of our closer industry competitors like Zencaster or Riverside. That's totally fine. Um, you know, I respect anybody who's trying to contribute meaningfully to solving some of these challenges. Um, 
I wish people would be a bit more original, but right. I think that it's our job to be original. It's our job to really only compete against ourselves and try to be better every version, try to optimize for our customer's experience. Listening is a huge part of that where we, um, where we get a lot of feedback and um, podcasters speak for a living. So we love listening to, uh, to the feedback that they have. And that's really helped us yep. kind of stay in our own lane and, and really just compete with our last version and, and get better and better. And also, you know, having a, a bias towards innovation as well, I think is another element here where, um, you know, we have made some decisions in our product. Um, I think, you know, having a product is essentially having a point of view mm. and we have a different point of view than Skype or Zoom. And our point of view is that content creation is different from uh, a call, a conversation. Um, even if you add a recorder to that conversation, that's different than, you know, a, a creative tool that is optimized for quality, the creator experience. The conversation is almost a secondary in Squadcast. It's uh, we're a recording platform that features conversations and a Skype and Zoom and the other the other um, the other ones that I've mentioned. It's more the other way around, right? Where they're a conversation platform that features a recorder. So I feel like that's um, as long as that's still true. You know, we're we're working to define our own category here, and I feel like that's um, you know, remote content production is more what what. Uh, what we see things as and um you know like teleconferencing things like that that's that's not really uh why we exist you know so i i feel like as long as that point of view is unique we'll be fine zach tell me when a company like yours does what i was waiting for you to do for a year which is to get video Mm -hmm. do you often also get plagued or confused by the idea of we should be known only for audio. We have to have mm. a micro niche. If we do audio and video, we lose our sort of, you know, we should stick to our lane, have our own micro niche, be specialty experts in one. Did those thoughts come to your mind? And if yes, how did you overcome them? Yeah, they 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 have come to my mind. And it wasn't obvious for us to add video. That was, a you know, through listening to customers um, like yourself, tell us uh, that you wanted video. You know, and that's uh, that's really kind of the catalyst. So I sent for you us. telepathic waves. Yeah, you, you got them right. Yeah, totally. Oh. And we put them. <laughs> you know, we 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 use them to uh, to energize our efforts of uh, of getting you know video working with our approach. That that's the thing. As I mentioned, our um, our progressive upload, our patent pending, you know, technology, our innovations. Um, that was something that we knew we wanted to add video recording when we created that. And, um, but it comes with some unique challenges of like, we essentially want to take what we've learned about how we record audio and apply that to video, but that's not necessarily like a straight path. You know, it's easy to say that. Um, so that was, you know, that was a big part of it, but, um, we started, with within a niche, you know, and I, I, and, and that being long form audio conversations for content creators. Um, so we viewed it as like, we're still focused on the same audience because this same exact audience is the one telling us that they want video. We're not all of a sudden shifting to kind of two markets where we have Mm. video, video content creators and podcasters as two separate things. We, because video landed at the end of very, um, we very much looked at still being in service of the same ones, but giving them tools that they, that they wanted to engage their audience. Um, and, you know, we will cross the bridge in the near future of, uh, f- like figuring out marketing to two different audiences. That's a, that's, uh, that's a non-trivial act on its own. So mm-hmm. we chose to focus on the technology first. We also have, um, you know, kind of as a, a counter example to kind of set some some bounds around how we think about this too is that we have people recording audiobooks on Squadcast and we always have nice and um you know and there's other forms of content that um that we help people create and that that's really awesome 
to to us. So um, that's another way to look at it. Is like you know um, we are uh, we're already serving people outside of you know uh, what however you define a podcast as, and um, and marketing is one thing, but product is another. And you know of course. Uh, product's always going to be out in front of marketing. So I, I just look at it as a you know an opportunity to help more creators. Still focus Lovely. very much on podcasters, but uh, but also video creators uh, are obviously you know can benefit from the platform as well. Yeah, Zach, tell us. You know, you mentioned that you spent some uh, invested some money and in, uh, sponsored the podcast movement to get feedback and mm -hmm. some presence, so that you get some traction rather than just you know two founders being in their office. You needed to get out into the market. So, is it advisable in the first few months when you your product is ready and you're going out in the market, you're not getting in traction. It's have a chunk of money to invest, get dive in to the market that you otherwise would have dived into two years ago. Say maybe you took a booth at the social media marketing world event. You're like, Oh my God, that's too scary. There are 5,000 people. They're going to judge my product right away. It's still a yeah. baby. It's just started walking. I don't want to do that. But still, do you think it's a good idea to make a splash and go there? It, be overwhelmed with the response and the critique that you get and then come back and work on it and go back next year and say that, 12 months I made it happen. Do you think that's a good strategy to have? I do. I, I, I also think that it's one thing to say it and it's another thing to do it. <laughs> of course. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and I, I actually, that was not intuitive. That wasn't like us knowing intrinsically how to, that this was a good idea to do. I was teaching a course at Cal Berkeley at the time. And one of my students just happened to be, um, the head of Intel's investment fund for the Middle East. And he knew more about startups than I did at that point. And we were having coffee um, before class or after, I think it was before class. And he was like, you need to get out there. Like all these startup, all these startup people say, you need to get in front of customers. Like the sooner you do it, the better. It's like ripping off a bandaid, just do it. Sure. And he knew that I had been kind of building uh on my nights and weekends uh for for the for the squadcast platform and um i don't even think he had tried it at that point but he was like how are you going to do that zach and i was like mm, rock and i my co-founder we're planning to go and attend this conference that's going to be in in la in anaheim and um, we're going to go and talk to some people there and kind of float the idea out and see what kind of feedback we get and he was like that's a good idea but you need to sponsor it like right. call them, get a booth. You need to be part of the show. You need to be part of the establishment, not somebody floating through the crowd with a t-shirt on. Um, and that's going to help you get better feedback. That's going to be better for your brand. Like you, trust me on this. And I was like, okay, but we're bootstrapping this. We got to pay out of pocket. Let's see how much that costs all this stuff. It's also the conference was in like two, three weeks from then. It wasn't that far off. And, um, and also, who the hell are we? Nobody knows who Squadcast is. You know, if I pick up the phone and call Dan Franks and pod, podcast movement, they're not going to know who I am. I haven't built up any relationship. Like, you know, you start to have a bunch of imposter syndrome anxiety around that too. Like we don't have any street cred. Nobody knows who we are. Um, these are things that we talked about in depth before we sponsored this event. We had all this anxiety and I'm so grateful that, you know, one, the show took a chance on us and let us sponsor we were able to come up with the cash. We were able to um, go with more than just me and rock, but also our team. My best friend's mom got us a hotel room. Thank you, Andrea. There was like <laughs> a whole bunch of things that like lined up. The show happened to be in California that year, which it's never been on the West coast before then or since. Um, oh, they've come back to LA for a podcast movement evolution. My bad. Uh, strike that. So you know, they, they don't come out to California all that often. So we were very lucky that th that timing, it's another element of the timing. There's a bunch of pieces of the timing that I could go into on the technology, but also on the platform or uh, community. And anyway, um, you know, we sponsored and we put ourselves out there. So I do, to answer your question, I do think it's a good thing to validate um, as soon as you can Lovely. for a number of reasons. One, you'll save yourself money. Like, we, the tendency is to get disappointed because you want a startup, right? You, you're like, oh, this will be so cool. What if I'm a startup founder? What if this is actually something? This is going to be so cool and life-changing. And I'm going to get to help so many people. So we start to want the idea to happen. So you start to look at it as like, oh, I'm going to prove myself right, you know, and, and not necessarily like looking at it as like, okay, I want to prove myself wrong. 
or maybe it's the other uh, way around. I think it's the, yeah, prove yourself wrong instead of proving yourself right. And that's the way that. we looked at it was like, we think we uh, constantly, we were like, we have to be wrong about this. We're super skeptical. Like we, this is not going to be a thing. We can't, who, who the hell are we? Like, you know, this is not going to be a startup. We're just going to keep taking the steps uh, until somebody will eventually tell us, guys, go home. This is not a startup. Like, you know, it's been fun. And I still feel like that sometimes, honestly. Um, I love that. And that just never happened. Everybody just like kept like wanting it to happen. And I think that that's something that doesn't happen for every startup. So one of two things will happen if you put yourself out there. People will say, I want this. It is something that's meaningful for me. I want to solve this problem. And I'm, I'm grateful that you're helping me. Let me help you. Um, that's one scenario. The other scenario is they're going to say, no, it's, it's a, it's a vitamin, you know, uh, this isn't really a problem that I have. Like, um, I'm not all that interested in solving it. Like, it's not a big deal. Um, and that hurts, right? That hurts, but we still need to listen to that person in that scenario Listen because you're enjoying this episode as much as I am. Yeah. All right. We you're go. back now. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, so the, um, if somebody tells you, no, I don't, I don't want this, you know, uh, I don't have I, fundamentally, this isn't a problem I'm interested in solving. That person is trying to save you a bunch of money and time. Sure. <laughs> by by helping you validate not that the the thing you wanted to be true is true but the opposite that it's not true but you get to go about your life and come up with another idea and you know you're if, if you if you stay on that path wanting to believe for too long you you waste money and time and you spin your wheels and you know there's stories of startups doing that um as well yeah. so you know it's not a bad thing either way I just turned 30. I am 30 years old. Awesome. You look much younger than 30. Hats off for <laughs> whatever you're doing, your early morning, early morning yoga or ah, whatever you're doing. I love yoga. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Awesome. I'm looking forward uh, to getting some gray hair. You're, you're rocking it well. I, li I like it. Uh, Zach, tell me, uh, as you're building this product, and like I said, I became a fan from the get-go. I called up somebody for a podcast interview. So what I've been doing, I'll just take a segue over here. And what I've been doing is me and my two daughters who are 15 and 11 now, we have in interviewed Gary Vaynerchuk, Grant Cardone, John Lee Dumas. We went around the world. We traveled. We took, we, we said, well, we got an appointment. We're going tomorrow morning. You know, school can happen later. Everything can happen mm -hmm. later. So we traveled. My girls loved it. I loved getting on with the girls uh when i introduced this to you know when the girls met gary v and all of these people they love the idea that a father is teaching kids entrepreneurship and we take that more seriously school and everything can happen later my girls come with me at the, from the age of 10 to the social media marketing world go and reach out to people for appointments they send micro videos can i have an appointment with you they get a lot That's of awesome. rejection they learn a lot of stuff now rejection is is a gift you know that's a skill Hundred percent. I love that, and all of these things, uh, all of these things, you know, hopefully make them who they want to be later. In in uh, my elder, we star, and my younger one daughter wants to have a horse stable, and uh, so I said, doesn't matter. This entrepreneurship training will somewhere fit in, and you'll, yeah. you know, it's it's never going to go waste. So they're entrepreneurs uh, too. Hundred percent. As we as we traveled around the world, met all of these people, did all of this. You know, we, this podcast is called the Internet Moguls of the World. People who leverage the internet to be able to build a business uh, amidst amidst and despite all odds. And when I say amidst all odds, because people feel, oh, despite all odds, and now everything is hunky dory. I don't That's think gone. it ever is. Just because I've got money in the bank and my company's taken off for a bit doesn't mean that I don't have fires to put off tomorrow morning. So, and you've acknowledged that so many times. You know, I loved when in the in our conversation over the last few minutes, you said this was not um, this was not intuitive. It just happened. So there were so many things that you know. Thank you for being so honest with us because some things are not intuitive. You still do them, and you see where the chips fall. And you know, and ma many times things things fail. Um, My co-founder is always pointing out that uh, so much of the work that we do as startup founders is not intuitive. Uh, there's so many things that are not intuitive. Uh, so. You know, I think uh, try to, you know, use your intuition, train it, you know, make it refined over time, but also be open to 
uh, the people who, you know, have, have done this before. And that's where I think advisors and mentors and, you know, conversations with other founders are so important. Right. So, and that also, you need to know who you, how much to listen, what not to, it's such a mix. It's such an, it's such an emotional roller coaster in terms of, you know, I think the Reese guy, the Reed guy from Netflix, I think mm. he may have an answer for this or maybe not. Maybe it's just Gary Vaynerchuk. Reed Hastings. Fast. Yeah, yeah. So, or maybe it's just Gary Vaynerchuk who just says keep, keep, keep uh, uh, putting out content out there. But you guys created a podcast platform. I love when you said in the beginning of the show, you said, "I want the guests to look and feel cool, professional as well." Most guests who are not professional podcasts, they land up without a mic. There's echo and there's all of that. Well, they are brands and amazing human beings and great entrepreneurs to reckon with. But they, yeah, we have to help our them. job. Yeah, we have to help them. I love that. I mean, I, I've never heard anybody say that. In this whole process of doing all of this and becoming an internet mogul like you have, when it comes to building a community around a brand, which is what all of us talk about, it's been there forever, but we talk about it more now. Build a community, the community builds the brand. Yesterday, I was watching the interview with the, the hundreds. I don't know if you know the hundreds, um, mm-hmm. the t-shirt company and all of that. So yeah. The community build the community, community builds the brand and all of that. So what is Zach's take on community? And then how did you build community? How are you building community for Squadcast? Um, well, there's already a strong foundation of community in podcasting. And in some ways, we kind of stepped into that culture. Um, but we've really embraced it at the same time. And I think it all comes back to uh, how open the podcast community was to come back to that first event where we put ourselves out there. I said, you know, some things about how we had anxiety about not having street cred or relationships or kind of knowing anybody. Um, And it's tempting to think, it's logical even to think that people will just kind of look the other way, not acknowledge you and just kind of whatever. But the podcast community is unique. The podcast community was so open to meeting us and getting to know us and telling us what they wanted. And, um, and was just really open um, and friendly from the get-go. Everybody is very collaborative in podcasting. If you look at any one category uh, of, of podcasts, like in your podcast listening app, chances are the top 10 shows, the, the creators have collaborated with one another. They've uh, recommended guests to each other. They've interviewed each other. Um, and that is unique that there's so much collaboration that's not really coming from a place of competition. Um, and that's really cool, you know, so we've embraced that, that wider culture of podcast community and we've really embraced it uh, through our own sorry, efforts. Sorry like, to interrupt. Does that mean that you would also, when you say creators are reaching out to other creators, so there's no mm-hmm. competition there, everybody. So would you also reach out to a Riverside or a Zencaster and, uh, you know, have some collaboration opportunity. You'd be open to those doing that as well. And that's what you recommend. Yeah. I've spoken, I've spoken with the founders a, a handful of times uh, of those moment. companies. Sorry, I, I didn't, we lost you for a second. Yeah. You're back. Oh, now. sorry about that. Yeah. I've, I've spoken to the founders of those companies uh, a handful of times. Like I've talked to people who are like on the board of zoom and, and other, other, you know, Microsoft is a customer of Squadcast, even though they have Skype and teams, all of their podcast production happens on Squadcast. And how did that know, feel when you made that happen? <laughs> did you go back and tell your, tell your mom and dad and your wife and get, guess what happened today? The yeah. Microsoft is now a client. It tell blows my feeling. mind. You know, it's, it's awesome uh, that it's awesome that they understand that content creation, remote content production is different than conversations and, you know, remote kind of calls. Um, And they understand that difference and the producers that they work with um, understand that difference. And the CTO, Kevin Scott's podcast is recorded on platform and he understands that difference. It's amazing. How, How does that make you feel? Uh, fantastic, you know, to be, (laughs) to be straight up about it. It's, it's like, it's validating on some level that, you know, I'm not crazy and I didn't spend the last couple of years of my life, like believing this. Um, and that, you know, what an honor to be able to help Microsoft, you know, uh, it's, it's awesome. And, um, and I think that's really beautiful. So, um, 
that that is something that um you know that that collaboration is really cool and um there is do, some do, level of competition you know i'm not going to lie about that either sure um you know, when we block each other on Twitter, it's kind of hard to have a conversation, <laughs> but I'm open if you're listening. <laughs> All righty. Love that. So tell me, uh, I've got three questions left and then uh, we, we wrap up the hour. Uh, yeah. Zach, when it comes to uh, when it comes to an outreach, so yes, you got Microsoft, you got all of them, but you're always as an entrepreneur hungry for. Do those guys know about us? Do they know we exist? We'd love to collaborate with these guys or those guys, or maybe I'd love uh, the Breakfast Club. You know, though that channel. They should mm-hmm. be on our on our thing. That's my favorite podcast. So, do you do a lot of outreach, or you know, just pick up the phone and or try to reach out to people and say, "Hey, this is who I am." Or is it cold marketing? You do Facebook ads at your stage of the company. What does yeah. an internet mogul do? Do you do out outbound, inbound, or both? The community is a big part of it. Um, to come back to that, and we have we have a community manager, Ariel, uh, who is awesome. Thank you, Ariel. Um, really fosters, you know, an open conversation with the community, empowers the community through different ways and empowering them to create content and collaborating on that. Um, but then also there's an element of virality to Squadcast because the first thing you do, the magic of our platform is when you invite and connect with somebody else and then you record together with them. Now, what we didn't know and what I don't think we could have planned is that podcasters because they also interview other podcasters or guests on podcasts may be inclined to start their own podcast that there's an element of virality here because if you get interviewed on squadcast you're getting kind of a passive demo to how easy this can be how good you sound when that episode comes out and you know that's something that um there's this metric called viral cycle time that I learned about after the fact, but we kind of knew that this was happening and blew our mind and all of those things like, uh, you know, far out example, um, extreme example, our, our advisor, Jordan Harbinger is a, you know, number one top podcaster and, um, all this like accolades and crazy stories and backgrounds and, and guests he interviewed Kobe and just like remarkable guests. And this happened with him. We met him because somebody interviewed him, on their show, he asked about the platform. The The host in this case was our friend, Eric Hunley. And Eric was like, oh, I know Zach and Rock. Let me send a quick email. And they'd get a kick out of talking with you. So this has happened um, many times. And I think that's the, to answer your question, that's the foundation of our growth is that, uh, that elements of virality. And uh, we do other forms of marketing too, mostly content marketing. So we have our own podcasts, we write blogs, we uh, speak at conferences. We've had our own events. We sponsor meetups. We um, sponsor newsletters. We um, try to do, we try to practice content creation, remote content production, and really, you know, walk the same path as our customers to have empathy and understanding for the work that they're doing. They're also podcasters are also trying to build their community. So in yep. some sense, we want to inspire them. We want to try new things and, um, and, and also kind of meta, like provide that as a resource to them about, hey, this is working for our community. Maybe that'll work for your community. Um, and that's something that's been really, really, uh, you know, refreshing that we don't have to do a bunch of ads or we don't have to. Um, yeah, I, I do email and call people, but uh, pretty minimally, in, uh, in, in fact. So I think that that's, that's something that's not really my style. Maybe I should more. Uh, that's not a bad idea, Avi, but um it's it's something that um hasn't really been part of our story because we have uh, you know we're we're so grateful for those uh that virality lovely so my last question zach is and i asked this at the end of every interview and uh because we want to show and make people hear of the person behind the internet mogul so this is a personal question honest disclaimer some people have chosen to decline to answer this because it's very personal and if you want to do that i totally understand it can get very it's because it can get very emotional so it's totally up to you are you ready yes who are you a big fan a bigger fan of the hulk or the iron man i told you it's going to be tough i'm gonna have to say i'm gonna have to say the iron man i think he's a little more tech so i think that's cool and why um, he's a tech founder, you know, I'm not really into weapon systems, but, uh, Tony Stark is inspiring as, uh, as, uh, as a tech founder. So 
That's so pretty cool. Awesome. Man. Awesome. And I asked this question because they say you see in others what you have inside of you. So everything <laughs> that you like in your favorite superhero is what you have inside of you. You are a tech founder extraordinaire, my friend. I have something tells me very soon, uh, you know, we'll 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 uh, be taking your name amongst the Jack Dorseys and uh, the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world just because your demeanor is so so easy, my friend. And that's that's what travels. They say it's not the platform. It's not the idea. It's the energy of the person behind the idea. And when the idea is right, the person emerges. The person and the energy together. And I and I and I know you believe all of that because you're into yoga and all of that. So, great, Zach. This has been fantastic. This has been a great story. I would love for you to pass on my uh, uh, regards and respect to Rock, uh, Oriol, and Andrea. All the people that you mentioned <laughs> in your journey throughout the the last one hour, and for all of you people watching. Uh, that was Zach, uh, another internet mogul, based in San Diego, Oakland, Oakland, California. Oakland, California. Uh, the founder of Squadcast. You will be hearing about it, especially for my audience watching and listening in India. You'll be hearing about this tool much more from me in all my interviews because I'll be mentioning this name because I, uh, I will be using this uh, tool as well. And all of you people who are listening must check it out. We're going to put a link at the end uh, of the uh, of the show as well. Check it out and see how this tool works for you. Content is everything. Community is everything. Outreach is everything. And just between all of these fits in Squadcast, I highly, highly recommend it. Uh, some of my friends work for it. They recommend it. We downloaded the tool about 11 days ago. And um, because one of the people I was rec I was uh, interviewing, they said, we're not coming in if you don't have Squadcast. So that's how good the tool is. Go ahead and check it out for yourself. Thank you very much for your time, everyone. Once again, my name is Avi Arya, father of two girls, six dogs, husband to a superwoman, a streetcar racer turned hotelier, now social media marketer and founder of Internet Mogul, signing off for now. And don't forget, you listen to the last three episodes and go to your Instagram account, tag Write your biggest takeaway and tag me. Every Sunday, we send you a book from one of the internet moguls, Courier to Your House. Thank you all for watching. This is Avi Arya signing off for now. You found